Uh, well, Flight of the Butterflies has actually used a number of new technologies uh, that are specific to number one, natural history filmmaking, but also to macro filmmaking. Because the film is in 3D, we have to be able to shoot very, very close together with the cameras. Two cameras makes 3D. Now, technically, that's very, very difficult to do because of the size of the camera. So we have invented, through Peter Parks and Vision 3 and the, 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 the technology that we used on a movie called Bugs, a periscope device that allows us to film very close macro images of insects in 3D. And that has been an innovation from our first movie, Bugs in 3D, and now we, Peter Parks in particular, has refined this technology and we used it on Flight of the Butterflies. The other problem we had really was that butterflies move extremely quickly. Um, in your mind, you maybe think that they flow and are floating around, but in fact, they zip around very, very quickly. So to be able to move the IMAX cameras and keep up with them was a real technical challenge. Two solutions to that. Number one solution was that we filmed almost everything in slow motion. So we were running, instead of running the camera at 24 frames in one second, we were running at 120 frames in one second which meant that the movement was more graceful and it meant that we were able to edit the film and join the shots together in a way that is, is poetic and probably how you imagine butterflies fly. Well, they don't, they're crazy. You look at them, you'll see they, they don't fly in slow motion. The other challenge was they fly wherever they like. They have no uh, 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 organized flight paths except that we witnessed in Mexico in particular that they will only fly where there is sunlight because they need the warmth of the sun in order to to give their muscles the energy to fly so they do not like flying in shadow so one of the ways that we controlled the butterflies was we created shadow paths we created barriers that they wouldn't fly into because they were in shadow and therefore they would fly along the sun path which allowed us to get the exact focus on the camera and also know roughly where the butterflies were going to go. So that came about from obs observation. We just watched and we realized that as soon as they went into shadow they would stop and get back into the sunshine. And I would say probably that was one of the most useful techniques for shooting the butterflies for the IMAX was this understanding the natural behavior of the animal and then using it to the filmmaker's advantage. To get the unusual camera moves in Flight of the Butterflies, we used a number of different techniques. Uh, near enough all the time the camera is moving. We used a, a techno crane, which was a very large camera platform device, electronically controlled with a telescopic arm that allowed us to get higher and higher and higher as the butterflies went higher. We used a helicopters to be able to film the point of view of the butterfly as it's flying. And the higher we went, the more we were able to get the shots of the butterfly. People often ask, Did we, were we able to film a butterfly flying a mile high and really an inch away from a butterfly a mile high? Unfortunately, the technology for that doesn't exist. And that's the one sequence in the film that we used computer graphic images to create this butterfly in flight. And to take you, we really wanted people to get so up close and personal with a butterfly and really understand how it uses the hairs on its head, it uses the, its feet to taste with, uses its eyes, and really go right in on all of these aspects of the butterfly that allow it to do this incredible migration and to do that in flight a mile high. This is just for one science sequence that we did in the movie. All of the, all of the natural history in the movie is real butterflies in a real place and it was a real challenge to get the shots. We've also often been asked how we actually did this physically because these mountains are at 10,000 feet and they're quite 
uh, difficult and also you're in a beautiful natural sanctuary that's the home of these butterflies and you have to film them without harming them. It was very, very challenging. We had very heavy equipment, but we had a huge and fantastic Mexican crew in particular that moved all this gear up the mountain and there were sometimes 50 guys carrying an arm of a crane that weighs 900 kilograms, you know, by hand you know, up to the shooting location. Just phenomenal amount of work, a wonderful commitment. Getting to the top of that hill, having been acclimatized properly, ending the, uh, ending the, uh, the trip up the hill, inching our way further, closer and closer to the world of the butterfly. Uh, came in by horseback at the end of it, and they started sprinkling, coming in, and I could see them growing in number, and then we arrived, and there they were. Suddenly you were in the world of the monarch butterflies and you had no strength left in you to do. We also had the challenge that although the uh, cameras we were able to get to 10,000 feet, when you are in the forest, the animals, the butterflies, are another 30, 40, 50 feet in the trees. So they are way up in the trees. So we had to get not only to 10,000 feet, but we had to get the extra 50, 60 feet into the air and be able to fly the camera with the butterflies. We thought of helicopters, of balloons, of wires, cables, all sorts of techniques. In the end, the best was this extremely heavy, cumbersome crane that was able to do the job for us with electronic controlled head that we could fly with the butterflies. So we're very pleased that we were able to give the sense to the audience that they are flying with the butterflies. The most difficult part of the flight of the butterflies, I think, the filming of it was just about everything. Um, because the creatures do what they like, that's natural life. So we had to work out ways of being able to film the smallest actions like the laying of an egg, to the biggest action, which is one, two, three million butterflies flying out of the trees and flying across the forests. So I think the challenges were what to do to follow these tiny creatures on the massive scale. Uh, we built small studio sets where we were able to do the tiny interaction and the macro behavior, the egg laying, the pupation, all of the, all of the small, uh, daily life of the insects and then on a bigger scale we were able to do aerial footage we were able to fly the camera using as I talked about the the techno cranes uh, and then when we came to the forests itself we had to uh, position our cameras wait for the sunshine to arrive the butterflies to wake up and then use the slow motion cameras to fly us through the forest with the butterflies. How we achieved the, um, the uh, beautiful images of the butterfly flying over Toronto, you know, coming to the butterfly garden and then flying over Toronto to start its journey south, that was very simply old-fashioned helicopter aerials with an IMAX camera mounted on the nose of a helicopter. And there are mounts that can do that and you get beautiful images. And we're, very, we're actually very proud of the fact that here in our hometown we show it beautifully uh, looking at a sort of sunset view of the city as a butterfly takes off on its southward journey to Mexico. Shooting flight of the butterflies involved a large number of people. We, we were able to uh, work very closely with the Mexican uh, cinema industry to be able to use the, uh, the technology, the very latest technology, but also we were able to get specialized technicians and uh, a number of, of engineers and helpers to get all the equipment to the top of the mountain and then spend, we spent two trips, um, two months, uh, waiting for the behavior of the butterflies. So it was like a small army traveling to the top of the mountain to wait for the butterflies to react to the sunshine and to the warmth because there was no control over what they did or when they did it. We just had to be there with all our equipment and all our people. The extra challenge was we took actors into this scenario. So with the actors came the makeup and the hair and the catering and the costume and all of the support team that are needed for actors. 
we had to take them into the butterfly sanctuary as well and have the actors ready to film as soon as the butterflies came to life. So the double challenge was getting the cameras there and then making sure the actors were there when the sun shone and the butterflies flew. Flight of the Butterflies, the story begins in, in the 1920s. So before there was any technology of internet or uh, radio tracking or there was nothing like this. So the scientists had to think of ways of being able to follow butterflies. Well, they just disappear. You can't chase them, you can't drive after them or run after them. So the technology in the 1920s and 30s and 40s was to come up with a tag on the butterfly and then when the butterfly was found the tag had an address and the tag was sent back to the scientist he would know where it had got to and then he could make a mark on a map and this technology was used right up until maybe 10 years ago the idea of tagging and in fact still today the butterflies are tagged and the landing place of the butterfly is sent back for the scientists. There are also technologies that will now allow you to tiny micro chips and tiny tracking devices but in the main it's still the same paper tag on the wing that, that allows you to track the journey of the butterfly. The uh, Ontario Science Centre is one of the most amazing destinations for seeing this film because the scale of the screen, the dome, gives the IMAX image the sense that you are actually there and being in the sanctuaries in Mexico with the tens of millions of butterflies was one of the most extraordinary experiences of my life and I think coming to the Ontario Science Centre and seeing it on the big screen is the next best thing. It's as close as you can get to visiting these forests. Um, there's been some sad news recently that the, the numbers of, of monarch butterflies are in decline. We were lucky. We may have filmed the very last year when there were tens of millions. So seeing them on the big screen, it may be the last chance to see millions and millions of butterflies uh, in their home in the forests of Mexico. We've often been asked whether the sound of the fluttering wings that you hear very prominently when you're surrounded by the butterflies in the monarch sanctuaries you know, is a real sound or did we create that with the magic of movies. That is the real sound. We recorded that on location in the middle of the sanctuaries and it's a beautiful thing because it makes people really feel like they're there because really 40 percent of the experience people often say of these IMAX films is uh, is the audio experience because there's a fantastic sound system we're able to deliver the feeling of being there not only visually but with sound as well with the real sound how we actually recorded the sound was phenomenally simple literally one microphone in amongst all the flying butterflies. That's it. It was very, very simple. I hate to give away something, uh, uh, indicate that something was so cheap to do. That was the easy part. There were plenty of very difficult things on this film, but that was actually remarkably easy. Experience the flight of the butterflies.